how to increase the monetization of your club's brands, brought to you in collaboration with Inter, and this is your panel. Please welcome them on stage. We have Vice President and Deputy General Counsel at MLB, Tanya Fikanesha. We have Head of Intellectual Property at FIFA, Daniel Solny. We have Founding Partner at Morrison Rothman, Alison Rothman. We have the Head of Legal Global Intellectual Property at Standard Chartered, Nigel King, and the in-house IP lawyer at FC Barcelona, Anna Geeks. Please also welcome to chair the conversation your moderator, managing partner at Branded Legal, Lorenzo Lita. One plus five, one of the biggest panels we've had. We're looking forward to the conversation. Lorenzo, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, welcome back from lunch. Uh, we have like uh, this opportunity like, to speak uh, about legal things after lunch, which for like a football conference like, would be a little bit like theoretically heavy, but, but it is not. And we are going like, to tell you why. Um, we are here. Um, representing the International Trademark Association, which is the largest uh, association in the world uh, dealing with intellectual property rights. Um, and like there are more than 30,000 members uh, in the association, uh, lawyers uh, and like people that deal with brands uh, also like coming from business and also like some football clubs that are, that are part of it. Uh, and here now we are going to speak also like uh, not only like on behalf of our um, association, uh, but also like based on our experience uh, in the field. And uh, I'm very happy like to have uh, a group of, of friends and amazing speakers. So um, I would like just to go deep into the topic, but before I would like to mention that we have created a toolkit, uh, which could be helpful for you. Like when you go home understanding, uh, and you want to understand a little bit more about the value of intellectual property and like how your club, your, your association, uh, your athletes could benefit from uh, their brands. Well, just uh, have a look at it. Uh, it's easy. You can just uh, uh, scroll on the app uh, and you can download it uh, and could be quite an helpful uh, uh, tool. And otherwise, you can contact any of us like to get any further information. So going uh, deep uh, uh, into the topic, uh, Daniel, I mean, I would like to start from you because like the World Cup is coming soon. So, uh, which is like, uh, in your experience, uh, the best way like to monetize brands and which could be like the opportunities that are given by the market? Well, thank you, Lorenzo. I, I believe what makes sense at this point is um, to just exemplify a little bit how important IP is for the commercial, uh, commercialization of a club, a league, etc. And I just want to give the example of FIFA. Like, so we have a revenue um, period where we measured the revenue, always what we call a World Cup period. So the last one was 2015 to 2018. And actually 85% of all of FIFA's revenue stems from commercialization of IP. Um, $6.4 billion in that four year cycle. And out of um, those 85%, um, it's divided basically between 50% more or less um, broadcast rights. So the sale of broadcast media rights but then 35% stem from sponsorship and merchandise. And finally, you have around 11% for ticketing. So um, that being said, so you have 35% that are completely brand-based. Um, and that is quite a large number, and it shows how important um, IP, and especially the commercialization of brands, is to create revenue for your club, league, association, what have you. Um, but this, of course, um, we're looking at it with sponsorship and merchandise from an association point of view. Um, at FIFA, we do not, you know, we don't have clubs, we don't have players, we don't have kits. So when I talk about merchandising, which makes up 10% of our revenue, it might be very different from what you see in a club. And I mean, Anna, you, you work for FC Barcelona, so maybe you could talk a little bit about, you know, how it is from a club perspective. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Daniel, and hello to you all. Um, from a club perspective, at least in the case of Football Club Barcelona, which I think it must be very similar to many other clubs, the main uh, important agreement that we have in relation to exploitation of the brand would be, as Daniel said, the sponsorship agreements, whether uh, sponsors look through the association with the club, and maybe not only with the club itself, but to some particular teams or to some particular businesses of the club, and that means great revenue. So you need to have your brand uh, enforced and well protected and make the brand awareness and obtain the fan engagement 
and make followers so that sponsors are interested in, in sponsoring the, the entity you're representing. And also the licensing program is also one of the, the most typical um, monetization programs that we have in order to obtain income out of the exploitation of the brands. So uh, also when fans uh, want to have like close relationship with the club, uh, they, they are keen on buying some particular products that they can bring home and they keep their relationship. So licensing program is also uh, one of the, the most attractive ways and traditional ways to exploit and to make money out of the brand. Thank you, Anna. Uh, I mean, you just mentioned the opportunity like to secure uh, the IP rights. Um, Tanya, uh, do you want like to speak briefly about it? Uh, Sure, so when we're talking about IP rights, there's of course patents and copyrights and trademarks. And when we're talking about brands, we generally talk about trademark registration rights. Those are super important to secure um, as a foundation for any sponsorship or licensing program. In addition, um, trademark registrations can, are important assets that can be sold or used as security. Um, they're important if you're trying to establish an online store um, oftentimes platforms will require trademark registrations um, and they're also an incredibly important tool in dealing with counterfeits. Thank you, thank you Tanya. And like Ali, um, I mean what about like the searches that have to be done by a trademark owner like before like uh, securing the IP rights? Yeah, it's a great point and it's really important to remember, um, you know, obviously Tanya just mentioned all of the different ways that you can secure your rights and the different types of IP, but it's important not to assume that you can just have it. So before you go ahead and try and register these things, it's very, very, very important to try and clear them first, make sure that nobody else is out there using them in ways that might be, um, you know, harmful to yours or in ways that might prevent you from doing it. And um, you know, not just from a legal perspective, this is important from a business perspective as well, so that you're not investing so much time and money into um, these, these assets like Tanya mentioned um, prior to, to actually being confident that you're able to. Um, and then one other thing I would consider as well is to think outside the box here, to think in terms of um, not just, you know, where your club is located, for instance, um, but think in terms of other geographical regions, where is your fan base, where is your user base, where, um, if you're talking about merchandise, where is most of your merchandise manufactured, where is it imported through? So there's a ton of different ways that you should be considering these things um, in addition to ancillary and supplemental um, business and businesses and industries that you may or may not enter into eventually as well. Um, and as we'll get into a little bit later, it's important to consider, for instance, just as one example, the digital space. Um, so we're not just talking about consumer goods when it comes to your jersey sales, et cetera, but think about digital assets, NFTs like Daniel will talk about a little bit later, um, and the digital space in general. Thank you, Ali. Actually, like, it's quite interesting like, to um, listen like, to, to these kind of comments. And I was thinking while you were speaking, you know, like about the different opportunities, the searches, et cetera, to when I was a kid that, I mean, I had like two passions. I wanted like to become um, a football player as every kid or a Formula One driver. <laughs> and unfortunately, I didn't have like any of, of the required <laughs> talent to do so. So I just thought, well, maybe like I should study law so at least like I will find a way like to pay my bills. Uh, but then I realized as soon as I started the law school that there was a way like to actually work with football and with Formula One and this is because, uh, because of brands. And this is like uh, something that make me think uh, of something that is actually relevant, uh, that is uh, like the next step in terms like of monetization of the brands, which is uh, probably the one that uh, the supporters of football know the better and like they are also like always checking in terms like of getting the numbers, the statistics, so we want this, we want that. Nigel, um, since uh, you are coming from Standard Charter, it, it is like uh, a pretty big bank and is most importantly like uh, in football, like the sponsor of Liverpool since 2010. Uh, do you, would you like to share with us your experience? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Lorenzo. Um, I think um, the monetization is, is, is critical, um, and, and sponsorship commercial model is super interesting. Um, it's, it's, it's a sort of, the key thing for a sponsor is really about brand awareness and leveraging off the reputation of, of the club, um, but also at its very pinnacle, 
uh, the reputation both of the sponsor and uh, the club are sort of at their zenith. It's this virtual cycle where um, the brand awareness for both uh, um, uh, really resonates and uh, there's, that, it increases the value uh, to both the sponsor and the club. Um, and there's just lots of interesting assets like um, that the club can monetize potentially. Um, you know, there's, there's various placements on the shirt, um, stadium naming rights, and so forth and so forth. Um, what's interesting from a, a club's from a sponsor's perspective is, um, and, and also for a club to monetize it effectively, is, is brand sector exclusivity. Uh, and what I mean by that is, um, a club needs to be sort of careful and sort of uh, the rights it grants uh, in terms of um, uh, to a sponsor. So, for example, um, if we use like um, many, many years ago, sort of like beverages, you know, in the, in the old days, it was pretty clear cut. It was pretty much alcoholic beverages and maybe non alcoholic. Um, but nowadays, if we, if we fast forward that sort of narrative there, um, there's sort of probably a water sponsor, there could be a beer sponsor, um, energy drinks. Um, I think the story is, you know, be careful of how much you give in terms of the real estate um, because you might not effectively monetize the entire brand sector. Um, there could be other things developing. Uh, you know, say for example, being alive to regulatory change. You know, so for example, with tobacco sponsors back in the 80s, that was rife. You know, that was a key sponsor for sports. But if you kept aware of, sort of alive to public policy changes, you'll become aware that maybe, well, actually tobacco is probably on the way out and you should be looking at sort of monetizing your club assets in other ways. Um, from a sponsor's perspective, we love to get a hold of players, literally and, uh, you know, virtually, um, whether it's a, a player appearance at our client function or to pair in, pair in sort of TV adverts and, and so forth. Um, it's really important just to clarify where um, the rights after the player, because a very high-profile pro high player will also be able to monetize their, effectively, their brand as well. Um, so there's a, there's a bit of a tension there where often um, you need to look at the fine print in the player's contract um, uh, to, to define where, sort of, where a player can fit in, in terms of a club, club um, exploitation, um, to something else which is more sort of personal. So, um, I think we were talking about it yesterday, uh, Daniel, like the three-player three, three player rule. Um, that's kind of uh, a, a, a rule of thumb, but not always accurate. So having three players surrounded by uh, a player doesn't necessarily make it a club context. You've really got to look at the fine details. Um, and the other aspect, just to probably the, the critical piece, is going back to that reputation. Reputation management. It's just really, really important for a club to sort of be aware of how it's perceived by the fans and the public and the media. And it's not just the club itself, it's the players and the sponsors. Um, and also potentially the leagues that it competes in. Um, I think, like for example, the Super League, um, that was sort of a very interesting um, exercise in seeing how uh, things were perceived in, in rel relatively a negative sense. And the clubs that were involved acted very, very quickly to, to, to diffuse that very quickly. So ultimately, if there was long-term uh, damage to the reputation of a club, that will ultimately diminish the value as well that you could extract from the sponsorship. Thank you, Nigel. I mean, Anna, um, like this conversation, like about uh, the, the sponsors, the uniforms, etc. like... Uh, on one side, made me think of uh, a football club Barcelona. Like when I was a kid, I was used like to see like the shirt of Barcelona, like without a sponsor, and this was like something that was quite unique actually in the market. Um, and then like I remember in uh, 1999, when like for the first time, at least that I remember, I saw like something on the shirt, which was just for the centenary uh, of of the club, um, and like all the impact of sponsorship in particular like on the t-shirts had an impact also like on merchandising like merchandising um, as uh, something that is driving which are of course like the colors uh, of the clubs etc uh, and then there is the issue of licensing that is like strictly connected like to, to merchandising and like sponsorship merchandising licensing are like the kind of contract with which we are dealing every day and you in particular like working in a club mm -hmm. um, I mean like what about it like what's the you, from your point of view, the yeah. relevance of it? From, from the legal perspective, what we usually explain to our business colleagues is that when they develop the licensing program, 
um, one of the most important things, well, I think that they should be focusing in two main aspects. The first one would be, what are the brands that you're going to exploit through the merchandising products? Because maybe you will have a very huge portfolio of different brands and logos, and you're not going to develop all of them and not, not going to be using all of them in, in the products. So I would first define what would be the main trademarks that you're going to exploit through these licensing agreements. Uh, then also think, well, in, in these trademarks, you could consider the crest or the name of the club, even the colors, or any other particular logo that you may define or design for a particular business. Uh, once you have that in place and confirmed, then you should also think of what are the products that you are going to sell in the market, depending on consumers' needs, uh, consumers' intentions or approaches, depending on the territories also. Uh, so you have the trademark you're going to exploit, the categories of different products you're going to sell, and also you need to define where are you going to, to sell those products, where are you going to execute the licensing agreements. And with that, from the legal perspective, would we say, okay, do we have all these trademarks registered so that the licensing are going, the licensing agreements are going to have like an object and they are not going to be void. Um, you need to make sure that you have all the registrations in place. Uh, I don't know if you are all familiarized with trademarks, but there's no unique trademark registration for everything. So when all the business and licensing uh, people think of one particular idea, you need to make sure that that trademark is going to be registered in that particular territory and for that particular product. Uh, otherwise, it will be like, mm, you don't have that right duly protected to execute the, the license, okay? Uh, then there's another important asset apart from the brand, at least for clubs, which are the image of the players that sometimes are also being reproduced in this, this kind of product. So this is some other asset that you need to make sure that you have in place in order to license it to third parties who may develop and sell products uh, using the, the image of the players. At least this is how we are working these kind of agreements from a club perspective here in Spain. But Tania, you're from the US and I think that you deal with some same concepts, but from a different model and different point of view. Right, and so the concepts are very much similar. We look to where the marks will be used or the brands will be used and in which territories and for what products or services. At Major League Baseball, what we do is we're the exclusive licensing agent for the 30 Major League Baseball clubs and the 120 minor league clubs. And so we will manage the portfolios on behalf of the clubs. Um, licensing agreements can be done by the clubs or by, by the league. Um, but it's super important that we are always thinking, you know, anywhere from three to five years in advance. I was in a presentation um, just before lunch here where they were talking a bit about NFTs and sponsorship and where, where is sponsorship going to be three or five years from now. And it was interesting to, I was like, oh, I was triggering questions for me to be asking our business as well. Um, because it's super important to be three to five years ahead of where, where you are currently, or at least knowing where the business is going so that you can secure those rights now. It takes a while in most countries for trademark registrations or applications to mature to registration. Um, and again, as we've talked, it's, it's really important to have that protection um, in a variety of jurisdictions. Um, even if you think, for example, in China, that you may not be marketing or selling in China directly, but if you have significant manufacturing, you will likely also have significant counterfeiting there, which we'll talk about in a minute, but it's, you will likely need to have a registration there. So it's, it's a bit about a strategy as well. Yeah, and these are like the challenges that you have like every day, like managing uh, the rights of all the, 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 the clubs, the 30 clubs of the major league, plus all the clubs of the minor leagues, it's quite challenging. I mean, like it's completely different point of view, like from just one club, also like balancing the interests, etc. And you, I correctly like pointed out like the digital transformation that uh, also the world of sport uh, is, is facing. Um, Ali, since you deal a lot like with the gaming industry, the esports industry, and in general like with digital entertainment, um, over the last months uh, we have uh, like seen a lot of, I mean, at least re read a lot of articles like concerning the transformation like of also football clubs 
from uh, just uh, football clubs into media companies. Um, a very recent example is the one of uh, AC Milan, which has been bought like by um, an investment fund from the US that uh, has also like participations in, uh, in Liverpool Football Club, in Boston Red Sox. And uh, it seems that uh, there is a, a significant uh, interest and in a number of investments that are coming also from uh, people that are in the football, I mean, in the sports industry in general, like LeBron James. Uh, but also, it seems that the, the Yankees are, uh, since you are like a big fan of the Yankees, like also the Yankees have invested that like the Yankees TV will be like uh, transmitting the games of AC Milan. Uh, this transformation into media company, it's something that probably like in the esports business, in the gaming industry, you have like seen already. Um, you want like to share a little bit like your knowledge about that? Yeah, I'm happy to. It's um it's quite interesting for me personally as somebody working in esports for so long um, and in the gaming industry to see this transition like you just mentioned um, and especially like Lorenzo mentioned as an avid baseball fan and Yankee fan as well so it's it's interesting to see this like I said because you've had organizations like the Yankees um, and athletes like Alex Rodriguez for instance investing in esports for years I mean we're talking like five six seven years ago they started doing this so as we see traditional sports getting eyes in digital entertainment, we've kind of had a, a leg up in, in this whole thing, um, you know, which is obviously a, an advantage and gives us a different perspective on things. Um, but it's, it just echoes a lot of um, what we've already discussed where they want to see that you have your ducks in a row. They want to see that you have your IP secured. Um, it's, a, it's a safety thing. If they're going to invest in you, they need to make sure that you're secure. Um, and again, this goes back to not only in the things that you're doing currently. Um, a lot of my clients, major esports organizations, their revenue is not generated from the players. Their revenue is not generated from even the games. Um, you know, of course, there is some, but the majority of their revenue is usually generated from streaming, from from media, from merchandising, like everything that everyone on the panel here has been discussing. Um, but, you know, these, these athletes are now becoming influencers, content creators in and of themselves. So they get ad revenue from their streams. They get, um, you know, donations on, in Twitch chat for doing X, Y, and Z. Um, they have sponsors on their, uh, they're wearing sponsored clothing. They have banner ads. They have overlays. Um, there are so many ways that brands and, and sponsors can throw money into Esports, and again, most of this not having anything to do with the actual gameplay itself. And so that's what I think you're going to start seeing a lot more of um, in traditional sports, whether that's football, whether that's baseball, you name it, um, as these, you know, industries start overlapping. Thank you, Ali. I mean, like, in this kind of digital transformation, like, of course, with the World Cup at the door, like, Daniel, I have to go back to you and also because I know that you are like quite interested into the NFT world, what's like your, your point of view, like also on the impact of, of NFTs into the digitalization of the football industry? Um, well, I think, you know, the word NFT is everywhere. There's almost nobody that hasn't heard about it by now. And it can also be kind of tiring, like, oh God, NFTs again. And like, what is really the value and how does what, value proposition does it give? I still think that it's a huge um, opportunity in sports. Um, I mean, you have the traditional or the obvious things like collectibles, right? You, you use your um, historical archive to, to put out moments like uh, the NBA did or started with Top Shot. FIFA just released their own uh, collectible project last week. Um, these are the obvious ones, or you can also leverage your brands, your logos, etc., to, to produce drops and have them and, uh, and sell them to fans, especially. Um, however, there's a lot more um, that clubs can do. I mean, I think the two big opportunities here are fan engagement, um, especially tied into with ticketing. I mean, if we, if we and that will happen for sure in the future that um, tickets will be sold as NFTs and you can then tie in special experiences 
if you're the token holder, you can even a year later, let's say you were at a game that was uh, special and everybody who was at that game then takes part in a raffle automatically and you get to win a money can't buy experience, let's say a meeting with a player, right? And it's just dropped into your wallet. Uh, you don't have to do anything else. But let's say you are not interested in meeting the player, right? I mean, you just might be like, yeah, I don't, or I'm not around and I can't do that. Normally, in a normal raffle, it will, the terms and conditions will say, well, not exchangeable for cash. Well, now you have a token in your wallet that if you don't want it, you can sell. So it's, it's a benefit for the fan also where you can say somebody else might want to do this and I can monetize on it. Um, and then there's also more non-traditional things that are popping up, how maybe you want to finance cer certain things. Um, like there's an example of a, a League Two club, so fourth tier, lowest um, professional tier in England um, of professional football, a club called Crawley Town FC. I don't know, some of you might have heard about this project that was acquired by a consortium, consortium of investors from the Web3 space. So very prominent actually people from the NFT world, also a smaller VC fund, etc. And they bought the club and then um, their consortium is called Wagma United uh, or Wagme United. Uh, we're all going to make it United. And they sold 12,000 NFTs. Um, the buyers of those NFTs um, get certain things. They get a kit. They have a kit sponsorship with Adidas and like uh, a generative art, a very known collection. It's called the Chromie Squiggle. It's very known in the crypto world and in the NFT world. Um, and you get other perks. You can also vote on certain decisions for the club. So it's like a combination of a fan token. Um, uh, but also, I think the main purpose also for that project was not only to generate initial income through the sale of that collection, but also Crawley Town has a fan base of about 5,000 people in South London. Um, so a very small fan base. But they were looking at, hey, can we actually, with such a project, generate a new fan base? that is not regional, that is not even national, but that is international. And actually the, the, the largest part of the buyers of that NFT were from the US. And now suddenly you have people watching those games um, that have never been to London, or at least never have been to Crawley Town FC. And I myself, out of interest, because I wanted to see where does this project go, bought one of those tokens, and I now do follow Crawley Town FC and check up on uh, you know, how they're doing moment's not going that well. <laughs> so there's already a little bit of also friction between the old fans and the new fans because of course the old fans, football fans being very conservative, a lot of them are like, what is this? Is this really necessary? Where are we going? But I think there's a lot of um, development, a lot of things that we'll see in the future that can be valu very valuable also when it comes to monetization. Very interesting indeed, Daniel. Uh, I think that like so far we've been speaking mostly about like the creation of the IP rights of like how um, I mean a club can secure their rights how like kind of trying to develop them but like let's talk about something that basically it's part, significant practice part of our pr daily practice um, Tanya like I mean we have to move to enforcement at some point I mean we are still lawyers so we have to speak about also like some legal things etc so like, I mean, what about the real protection? What can be done by, I mean, by the clubs or by the leagues in order like to protect their IP rights? Yeah, so counterfeiting is obviously a, a huge issue um, in sports and for the clubs. I know there, we were looking at some numbers last evening and it's, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars or euros that the clubs are losing each year due to counterfeits. Um, and so there's certainly ways to go about protecting your IP rights. Um, at the league where we handle um, on behalf of the clubs both on the ground enforcement and online enforcement. On the ground enforcement is around the stadiums making sure that we're working with local law enforcement to ensure that there are no sellers of counterfeit merchandise near the, um, near the ballparks or in, and in, in, in the city. Um, we'll also work with customs officials um, and private investigators, law firms, um, both where games are being played and then also in um, countries of manufacture such as China or Vietnam, um, among others. Um, and so it's really just having a sort of a, a cohesive strategy on how to deal with that. So that's the on-the-ground enforcement. 
But as we all know, the marketplace is moving on, has moved online, and, and the counterfeiters follow the genuine merchandise or the genuine market. So we're seeing literally hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of um, counterfeit listings on social media, on online platforms. Um, there's hundreds of online platforms. There are also fake websites, you know, cheapjerseys.com or cheapkits.com. Um, and so it can be a little bit overwhelming for sure. We often work with a third party vendor, but you can also just go on these marketplaces and social media on your own and they have takedown notifications. Generally, you need a trademark registration, which is why we were sort of talking about that earlier. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it, it can be sort of daunting, but it's super important to do. And so we, we do it on a daily basis. So that's protecting our rights and the merchandising rights, but I know we also want to make sure that we're looking to sponsors and uh, working with our sponsors on that. Nathaniel, I know you do that as well. Yeah, indeed. I mean, um, basically, you're, you're um, licensing your brands to your sponsors to use, to associate with the league, the club, the event, uh, what have you, and the sponsors get exclusive rights, so you have to make sure that nobody else uses those and kind of rides, rides on the coattails and makes themselves out to kind of be a sponsor without, without having actually paid for it. So um, especially in, 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 you know, surrounding the World Cup, there's a lot of activity of uh, non-sponsor companies that want to jump on uh, that train and either where it's pretty simple still to counteract if they use your trademarks, you know, the logo of the World Cup, for example, or the logo of your club, then you just um, do regular enforcement, it's trademark infringement, that's pretty simple to deal with. But of course, every, I think everybody here is also aware of, you know, uh, ambush marketing, where then you're actually not using, directly using often any, um, any brands, so it's a little bit more difficult to deal with that, because especially in a lot of countries, it's a concept that in legal terms is not legislated, so there's no laws against ambush marketing. Um, that's also why when, when uh, FIFA goes into a country that doesn't have these types of laws, there's then special legislation. For example, in Qatar, we have a specific law that was passed that covers a lot of other things, but it also covers ambush marketing or anti-ambush marketing legislation to really make sure that we can deal with these types of issues, whether they're online, um, but also on the ground, as, uh, as Tanya already said, around the stadium, so if, you know, people come up and start distributing third-party products that we have means to counteract that because there's normally a clean zone around the stadiums where only the sponsors are allowed to activate. So that's something how, you know, you basically keep the sponsors happy. Yeah, I mean, like, ambush marketing is, is a huge topic and, like, requires a lot of care, in particular, like, in handling it, like, sometimes. So, so uh, for sure... It's also like a matter of information, of communication, and how this is dealt. So like sometimes the problem that we face, for instance, like as outside councils of companies, is to address in the right way the problem of ambush marketing because you don't really know how far uh, like the marketing of, of, for instance, of a club would like to go. So in that sense, for instance, Anna, like since you work like uh, as in-house counsel, like in one of the most important clubs in the world, uh, what's your experience? I mean, like, uh, and what's the benefit that you feel that the club is having by having an IP council internally? I think that it's really important because as we were all mentioning, there are a lot of different kind of um, ways to exploit the brand. Uh, so there are a lot of things and a lot of work to do in relation to the brand. So from a legal perspective, there's also huge work to do. So if you have an internal IP lawyer, um, at least you have the legal perspective uh, inside the club. Uh, someone who can, even though if you have also external advisors, you can also have like one, one point of view and make that everything is consistent, all the strategies, etc. And I think that one of the other things that has been interesting, at least in my case, was the, the option to like raising education to our, the, all the other departments, the business areas of the club, who were not um, aware of what a trademark is in legal terms. What does it mean when I register a trademark? That means that you have to use it as you have it registered because the protection is only about 
that specific logo that you registered, not alterations of that same trademark, or the obligation to use the trademark, because if you don't use it, then the trademark could be lapsed. These are concepts or ideas that business people don't know, and I think that it's important for them to be aware in legal terms of these basic tips of uh, what trademarks are. Uh, so I think that it's really, really interesting to have this uh, internal vision uh, from an IP expert. And then also um, you can relate and, and, and coordinate all the external advice that you receive. Uh, but I think that it would be a recommendation from my point yeah, of view. No, absolutely. And I really believe that like you, mm, I mean, you touched a super point, which is the education and the internal education that has to be done. And like somehow we are also here like because of that, like we would like to um, have um, clubs, I mean, a football industry that is like super well educated about brands, about the intellectual property rights. And uh, about that, like Nigel, uh, what do you think, you know, like about the importance of working closely, like for, for a company or even for a club, like with the, uh, with the associations, like of course, like the International Trademark Association, but like in this case, even more like with the World Football Summit, like the kind of benefits, etc. You want to talk a little bit about that? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, I think, um, well, just to sort of recap, there's sort of a two, couple of things there about sort of like uh, building on sort of Anna's point about the in-house counsel there, um, just sort of picking up on that. I think a lot of this is really commercially driven and with the external counsels, they're just, they're just they're, they're experts, they're subject matter experts, but they're just a little bit further away from the commercials and having an in-house counsel really it's that synergy of sort of legal supporting the commercial objectives and having an in-house counsel really drives that and there's efficiencies there. And then, like to Anna's point, it's educating both within the company but also your external lawyers. Actually, this is what the club's vision is. I think it's super important. Um, sorry, Lorenzo, what was the other part of the no, question? No, sorry, the other part was like about like the, co the collaboration with the association, like the benefits that like yeah. you can have like being for instance, uh, interacting yeah. with INTA or like with, with the World Football Summit? Yeah, um, look, I, th I think INTA is, is, is amazing. Um, it provides a real platform for subject matter experts in the trademark field on a global basis for you to able to access and network, get sort of the up-to-date knowledge on a lot of the issues which we're trying to face here is, is often quite cutting edge and challenging from a legal perspective. So it's amazing just to be able to benchmark where you're at with other colleagues in sort of similar fields. Like here on this panel, we've got sort of everyone across sort of the industry here. So it was just amazing to actually talk about things like this and just the challenges we all face. Um, also, it's just great for networking um, and also um, into actual, into actually provides a, a great platform for advocacy, so policy work. So um, laws are created sometimes in a vacuum. Um, but into provides that platform where brand owners can actually express certain concerns or deficiencies in legislation uh, in certain countries and sort of pitch towards that. Um, I myself was on a committee, subcommittee, dealing with well-known marks, and that's a sort of a legal term dealing with um, trying to um, increase legal protections for very, very well-known brands. Uh, so it's just easier to enforce um, your legal rights. So look, it's an, an incredibly valuable resource and, and great organization. Thank you, Nigel. Ali, like, do you want to um, share also like your point of view also like yeah. based on also the kind of benefits that for instance, like a club in the esports uh, business can have like and in interacting with such kind of associations? Yeah, I couldn't agree more with Nigel. I mean, everything that we've all spoken about on this panel today is just a little snippet of what goes on in our worlds every single day. Um, the ability to use your IP as both a trademark or as a sword and a shield. I mean, this is so much bigger than just a legal conversation. This truly is a, a business conversation that legal is here just to help facilitate. Um, and it's our jobs to help the business and not to tell you no, but to tell you how to do it. And so none of what any of us does every day happens in a vacuum. We work collaboratively together as, you know, like Lorenzo said, outside counsel, in-house counsel, brands, um, league, teams, or I mean, all the players in the space, for lack of better terms. Um, we all work together and 
we're all here on this panel, but we all also work together. We go to into events together, which allow us to have these conversations um, and our different perspectives coming in. Truly, I wouldn't be able to do my job or advise my clients um, as effectively without these different perspectives. Um, and that, that goes industry to industry. So yes, of course, I work very heavily in esports and in digital, um, but these conversations are, are all relative and they're all relevant um, across industry and across geographical region as well. So having that network is truly, truly invaluable. And actually, like, all these kind of principles, like, apply to any kind of club. I mean, like, um, there is no, basically, club in the world that doesn't have, like, at least one brand or more brands. And all of them, like, are valuable and, like, might deserve, like, the right protection. Also, because, in general, like, brands in the world of sports, in general, like, are what we call, like, super brands. Because, like, when you go to, to like, you take like a legal book, you would say like a brand, like it's a sign which has a distinctive character, which means a lot of things. But like then the problem is like when you transfer this concept into the football industry, to the sports industry, you will like deal with super brands, with brands that like add to this distinctive character, something that is extremely important, which is the passion. And like I hope that today we have been able like to transfer to you, all of you like the passion that we have, of course for football, of course for sports, but in particular, like for intellectual property. Um, thank you, David. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's it, yeah, thank you. Um, great balance panel. Um, again, uh, as with all of our speakers today, I just wish we had more time. Uh, we are running tight on the clock today, but um, I'm sure that we'll invite you back another time if you'd like to come back, World Football Summit. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, our panel.